Welcome to the Shutter. I've got four great Bigfoot accounts for you, uh, including a request from Joe Troop. He wanted to hear some Southwest PA stories. I was able to find one. Now, I've got a few sources, so I'm sure I'll be able to find some more. But uh, that's going to be the second story on here. It's kind of short, but it's a really good one. Okay, this first account is from a man named Marsh, and it's called The Man Beast of Dorian. All right, get ready and settle in. In 1920, while I was in Panama, an old and experienced American prospector named Shea came to me with a strange story. He had just returned from a trip to southeastern Dorien. He and another American had ascended the Sambu River, which enters the sea on the southern shore of San Miguel Bay. The country was, and still is, wholly unknown. Even the mountain range back from the coast did not appear on the maps. Shea and his companion worked their way with great difficulty to the headwaters of the Sambu, and there they became separated. The other American has not been heard from since. When Shea lost his companion, he lost his canoe and most of his equipment. So instead of attempting to return down the Sambu River, he decided to forge his way to the Pacific Ocean across the Andean Range to the west. He reached the divide in a state of exhaustion and by a stroke of luck stumbled on an old Indian dugout, abandoned on the bank of a small river running into Pinas Bay. It was nearly dark, so he camped for the night at a considerable altitude not far from the divide. All that night he heard footsteps of a large animal in the jungle above his camp, and when dawn came he heard a curious chattering sound. He looked up and saw standing on top of the bank an animal that appeared to his unscientific mind to be a cross between a man and a gigantic ape. It was six feet tall, walked erect, weighed possibly 300 pounds, and was covered with long black hair. It was glaring down at him and chattering its teeth in rage. Shea whipped out his revolver and shot it through the head. It tumbled down the bank and lay still beside his canoe. When Shea recovered from his fright, he measured the animal crudely. It was heavily built, like a gorilla, but the big toes on the feet were parallel with the other toes, as in a human being, not opposed like thumbs, as in all other monkeys and great apes. Unfortunately, Shea was too exhausted to bring any part of the animal back to civilization. He barely managed to get down to Pinas Bay on the Pacific and attract the attention of a coaster, which took him to Panama more dead than alive. I saw him many times after that in the hospital where he eventually died from chronic malaria. Some of his last words to me were a solemn oath that the story of the man beast was true. Of course, my first reaction to this story was extreme skepticism, but I found to my surprise that many trustworthy men who had penetrated into the little known parts of tropical America did not share my disbelief. The man beast is reported to have been seen in many locations. A Spanish gold hunting expedition in the 17th century reported that it had shot 14 of the man beasts not far from the same Pinas Bay. The Indians from Ecuador to Nicaragua assert that the creatures inhabit isolated jungle covered mountains as do the gorillas in Africa. Nothing will persuade an Indian to spend the night on such a peak. When I returned to Washington and mentioned the matter to Dr. Ho of the Smithsonian, I did not get the pitying smile I was expecting. On the contrary, he said he had been getting reports of this sort for 20 years and was inclined to believe there was something to them. I am a veteran of the U.S. Army with a clearance to lose, so please keep my name out. Sometime in 2001, my now ex-wife and I were driving towards Granton, PA, on Highway 81. It was late at night. My wife and I were talking to help break the monotony. I just noticed a very dark object leaning over the edge of the road as we drove past. We passed extremely close to the object, close enough for me to feel shocked to see a large hairy section of well-muscled leg and a big hairy wrist and hand as the creature turned and strode down the embankment as we passed. The incline he had gone down was several hundred feet at a very sharp angle. My wife screamed and grabbed me. 
I slammed on brakes and reached for my 20 gauge shotgun. My wife screamed again and hysterically told me no way in hell was I getting out of the car. I tried my best to tell her, hey, I'm combat trained, I have a weapon, I just had to see what the heck it was. But she would have none of it and kept freaking out. In disgust, I drove off mad at the world for letting me get a tiny glimpse of one of the world's greatest mysteries. What a tease the whole thing was. I wanted to see the entire thing for myself, but what can I say? It looked like a linebacker with a serious hair issue. I would estimate it to have been at least 8 feet tall. What really surprised me was the attitude of the thing. No fear of our vehicle at all. My wife and I have both seen bear before and agreed it was not a bear. What bear can walk down the decline on its hind legs? I spent the rest of the trip staring out the window, wishing I had seen more of whatever it was. I was visiting my parents' home in Lawndale, Missouri. I lived in Warrensburg at the time and it was about a four hour drive to get there. Because of the drive, my four year old son and I would stay for at least a week. It was probably 2 or 3 p.m. in the afternoon. My son, their dog buddy and I were all sitting on the back deck chatting and something caught my attention directly ahead of me and a little ways off in the distance. I remember thinking it was a person but as it drew closer, I could see long white hair covering it. I had an instinct to instantly get my son in the trailer, so I hurried him inside. I closed the screen door and continued to watch this thing up the slight hill and toward the trailer. I felt horrible for Buddy, who was an outside dog, because I had left him out there and he was very scared. He had hopped down from his chair and got under it. Buddy was a brave little dog, used to helping herd cattle with my dad, but he was shaking and barking very unconvincingly at the thing that was approaching. I stood there inside the doorway and just stared at it, though I didn't connect Bigfoot with what I was seeing at the time, and I think I might have heard about Bigfoot only once or twice many years before. I kept saying out loud, what is that, what is that? And my son kept answering, I don't know. I know without a doubt that it was a Bigfoot, and was well aware of our presence even before I was aware of his. He, or she, though it felt more masculine, walked what seemed intentionally in our direction, and I know he must have heard Buddy barking, but he acted as though he didn't. The Bigfoot seemed to be in no hurry at all, almost like he was just out for a stroll. He continued toward the trailer until he reached a wood fence that served no fencing purpose but was more for decoration. He stayed on the opposite side of the fence from me, but being that the fence was a long horizontal pole kind, I could still see him quite clearly. Buddy was still barking, though not nearly as often, and yet the Bigfoot paid him absolutely no mind and didn't look in Buddy's direction, which was also my direction. The Bigfoot wandered slowly beside the gate while looking down at the ground as if he was looking for something. He was slightly hunched over, but still tall, although I wouldn't guess as tall as other Bigfoot that have been seen. He was at least three feet above the fence, I would say between five and a half and six feet tall. Also, I would guess that the deck was about 30 feet away from the fence. I consider that very close and feel blessed that our encounter lasted at least three minutes, maybe longer. The most distinguishing characteristic of it was the brilliant long white hair. It seemed to shimmer in the sunlight. I have to say that it was beautiful and very clean. The details of the Bigfoot are fuzzy for me, as my mind was constantly reeling as to what in the world I was seeing. I do remember being able to visibly see a face. Also, something about it gave me the impression that it was old. Maybe it was the white hair or the slow way it was walking. I just felt it to be my elder. As he continued to walk alongside the fence, I realized that he would soon be out of my sight and on the other side of the detached garage if he continued walking in that direction. I wanted to keep watching it so badly. I didn't want to lose sight of it and wanted to see it without the glass interfering. So I opened the screen door just enough to squeeze my head through. He was still beside the fence. The next thing that happened still brings tears to my eyes and covers me in goosebumps. I know that he must have heard the screen door squeak open because as I was turning my head to look at him, 
he was turning his head to look at me. This was the first time that he had acknowledged that we were even there, and he was looking directly at me. It was an amazing moment, and I will never forget the feeling of peace and calm that washed over me while I was staring at him. His eyes were big, round, and black, but they had emotion in them. I saw a sort of sadness in his eyes, and also a sort of kindness. I knew while we were staring at each other that he would not hurt me and was not aggressive, but rather seemed very calm and peaceful. To this day, I wish I could go back to that very moment and step out on that deck. I wish I would have offered him a friendly hello. Instead, he seemed to wait to see what I was going to do. When he realized I wasn't moving, he turned his head back to the ground and continued walking in the same direction. In a few steps, he was on the other side of the garage and out of my sight. I ran as fast as I could toward that end of the trailer and into my mother's bedroom where she was still sleeping. I nearly tore the curtains off the window trying to find him again. My mother was not happy with being woke up in this manner and asked what was going on. I didn't know what to say. I didn't really know what was going on myself. My son was also looking out the window trying to catch a glimpse of the Bigfoot, but we never saw him again. I was so hyped up and rattling things off to my mother about what I had just seen, and she asked me, what was it? I said I didn't know. She asked if it was a bear, and I said no, it was definitely not a bear, and it was walking on two legs like we do. She asked if it was a dog, and I told her no. It didn't look like a dog, and it was way too big to be a dog. I couldn't answer her questions, because they were my questions too. I was very anxious to relay to my dad what I had seen and hopefully get some answers from him as he worked outside on the land for a living and I figured he had to have seen it too. When I described what I would seen, he claimed to have never seen anything like it. He kind of acted like he didn't believe me, but he's a really laid back type of guy and not much gets him excited, so it might have just been that case. Speaking of the events of that day with my mother. She recalls that I was terrified to go outside on the deck alone anymore. I don't remember that, but I don't remember any more of that visit either. When all is said and done, I am thankful that Buddy and my son were there to confirm what I saw that day. Wow, just an incredible account. The behavior of these creatures appears to be so much different from each other from place to place. Uh, as far as the man beast of Dorian, I wouldn't recommend shooting a Bigfoot with anything more than a camera. Just saying. A uh, big thanks to Joe Troop for the request, and a big thanks to all of you that take a moment to hit that like button. Really appreciate that. If you subscribe, make sure you hit that notification bell so you can join me here next time for the Shutter.